Uh, I was sitting there and I was thinking about this series, Satan's Favorite Lies. Uh, we've talked a lot about some issues uh, that are hard issues. Uh, we've talked about everything from trusting God in a way to letting go of control and trusting Him. Uh, we've talked about money, which is uh, close to a lot of people's hearts. Uh, we talked about sex which people can either feel guilt or shame for how they have messed up, or they can feel freedom and forgiveness from Jesus. Uh, today's no exception. We're, we're talking about this lie that Satan likes to uh, tell us in our culture, which is that God grades on a curve. Or simply put, that good people go to heaven. And this is one of Satan's favorite lies today. Many people... Uh, in our day, believes this, by the way, uh, as well as in the church. It would probably, in a way, I don't know if it does anymore, but back in, a few years ago, I think this would shock people that churches are actually preaching that if you're good, that'll get you into heaven. If you're good, if you know Jesus, that'll earn you favor with God. It's very unbiblical, and it's not what the scriptures teach at all. Uh, the reality is, if Satan gets us to believe this lie that God grades on a curve, uh, he's really happy when we start believing things like this. Because if we believe God grades on a curve, then Satan's got us right where he wants us. Because here's the reality. If we were to just go out onto the street today, let's just say, let's head to Tim Hortons and we'll ask people this question. Do you think you're a good person? Majority, if not all, will say absolutely, because here's the thing. When we believe this lie that God grades on a curve, people always put themselves on the good side of the curve. No matter who you talk to, this is the reality. So when it comes to Jesus, Jesus becomes a path instead of the only path. And this is what we have seen in our culture over and over. So if we believe God grades on a curve, Satan has us right where he wants us. Or if we believe that good people go to heaven, Satan's got us right where he wants us. So if we believe this lie, here's what we do. We look to other people and we compare ourselves with other people. Right? I'm guilty of this. I've done this over and over in my Christian experience, especially when I was younger, right? If we were taught behavior modification, here's what we do. We, we look at a person who's not doing well, and we go, at least I'm not doing what they're doing. If I was doing what they were doing, I would be really horrible and evil, but I'm good. And here's why this is such a horrible lie, because never are we to compare ourselves with each other. We are com to compare ourselves with the only perfect person there ever was. His name is Jesus. And when we compare ourselves with Jesus, here's what we see. We have fallen far short. When we compare ourselves with other people, we start to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, by the way, a lot of this plays out in moments where people pass away, right? One of the first things that we m many times say is this, well, at least they're in a better place. And as a pastor, one of the pressures you have is to do funerals. And it's very politically correct. And we want to give assurance to people that your loved one knew Jesus, that they're going to be in heaven, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I realized this as a young pastor. Uh, I was in Winnipeg. A uh, young guy died on the oil field. I had no idea who he was. I was just asked, hey, you're young. You look cool. You could relate to his age group. Would you mind coming and doing his funeral? I said, okay. Uh, it was my first one I ever did. And I remember pre preparing for that and I just prayed and asked God, God, I want to represent you. I want to feel pressures of assuring people that this young guy is in heaven. I have no idea. I didn't know the guy. All I have to do is be faithful to the word of God and to Jesus Christ and the gospel. And from that young age, I was 23 then, I said, God, I will reject doing a funeral if it means I have to lie about who you are. 
so ever since then, uh, I've rejected doing funerals if I really didn't know the person, if they just needed a pastor to come in to do it, just because I can't stand before people and say, well, at least they're in a better place, because to tell you the truth, I have no clue if they're in a better place. And sometimes we just throw that term out there, and I've avoided even saying that term because a hug goes further than saying any term. The main force behind this lie that Satan gives us is this, just do your best. And in the end, you'll be in heaven. That's his lie. That's the main force behind it. And what this becomes about, here's a a term. I'll give you the theological term. If you don't remember this, that's fine. But it's moral therapeutic deism, which is simply this. Here's the idea. We are able to earn favor with God and justify ourselves before God by virtue of our behavior. So we are able to save ourselves by doing good, by being moral. And if we do that, then in the end, here's the thing. Our good will outweigh our bad, and God has no choice but to accept us. That's the lie of Satan. We're going to break this lie down because it's an ancient lie. And we see it played out in really four areas. I'll mention them, then we'll go a little deeper. The first area is this. As long as we're sincere, any path works. As long as we're sincere, any path works. How many of you have ever heard this? Okay, good. As long as we're sincere, right? So I've even had Christians say, Howie, I know you mentioned Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, but man, they're sincere. Yeah, they're sincerely wrong. They're not preaching the Jesus of the Bible. They're not declaring the Jesus of the Bible. Are they nice people? Yes. Are they nicer than some Christians? Yes. Do they do, in a way, do they serve more than some Christians? Yes. But their base is not Jesus only. Sincerity will never save us. And if we believe this, that lie has been successful. It's won the day in our culture. Get this. It's also won the day in our churches. As long as I have good intentions, as long as I'm sincere, then God will love me. Then God will save me. Here's the second lie. This one is a God of love would never send anyone to hell. Now, it's a powerful lie. Uh, I wrestled with this even as a pastor because you're trying to figure out, well, why would a God of love even have a hell in the first place? So all of us, if we were sincere in this area and said, you know what, I've wrestled with this. I've really wrestled with it. It makes no sense to me that a God of love would send people to hell. In fact... This lie is so powerful, I'll just say it. It's become politically incorrect to talk about hell, not only in our world, but in our churches. I've had people say to me over and over again, how I I, I never hear about hell. I never hear about it. And here's the danger when we talk about hell. Because when we talk about hell, the danger is this. Some people will feel like we're better than them. And I want to say right away, this has nothing to do with us being better. So we don't stand up in arrogance and say, ha, we figured it out, you haven't, ha ha, you lose. That's arrogance. That's absolutely craziness. But if we truly love Jesus and the scriptures, why wouldn't we talk about hell? Why? It's right there. It's all through scripture. In fact, the Bible talks more about hell than it does heaven. We like to talk about heaven, but it's been politically incorrect to even mention hell in our churches. So we're going to be politically incorrect today. Uh, and we're just going to talk about this. And, and I'm not standing here as if I'm better. Don't take that. 
but I want to be faithful to God's word. I, I want us to see that Satan has this lie out there that because God's a God of love, he will never send anyone to hell and he'll accept all people. But the scriptures do not teach that. I was reading a book and I read this. I'm just going to read it before we go into it. He says this, the avoidance of difficult things of scripture is happening all the time. Of sinfulness and hell and God's notable severity. It's idolatrous and it's cowardly. If a man or a woman who teaches the scriptures is afraid to explain to you the severity of God, they have betrayed you. They love their ego more than they love you. And in the same way that it is not loving or kind to coach your children on the dangers of the street, right, parents? You'd tell your kids, don't run out onto the road, don't play on the road, uh, and the dangers of the swimming pool, right? You've, uh, good parents advise their kids that you could drown, you got to be safe. So it is not loving not to warn men and women about the severity of God. Here's the thing. There's an eternal hell. We can't get by it. It's there in scripture. It's not uh, philosophical uh, speculation. It's a fact. There's a real hell. It's going to be full, by the way. Many will not pass through the narrow door. Many will not go the narrow way. They'll die on this side of the door without ever recognizing Jesus as their Savior. And they will stand before a holy God, and they will be judged for their deeds and misdeeds. You need to recognize this. It's in Scripture. And some people will go, I don't believe that. I don't believe there's a hell. And all I'd say to you is, dear friend, come to Jesus or you're, you're going to experience it. Come to Jesus or you will experience it. And if I'm wrong, I'd simply say this. I have nothing to lose and everything to gain. If you're wrong, you have nothing to gain and everything to lose. Jesus would explain hell in the most painful terms if you read the Gospels. He does this. He speaks of hell more than anyone else in the Bible. So Jesus talks about it more than anyone. He likens hell to a place of conscious torment. It's eternal. It's unending. And Jesus says this. It will be a place where people are weeping profusely, where people are gnashing their teeth, which is grinding their teeth in utter darkness, and it will go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And don't believe the cartoons, please. Don't be a fool. Satan does not rule hell. Jesus rules. In fact, if you don't believe that, the Bible says that Jesus is Lord of all. And in Revelation 14, it says this, Satan, demons, and those who do not pass through the narrow door, here's what it says in Revelation 14. They will be tormented forever, get this, in the presence of who? Of Satan? Of demons? No, it says, in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God and his holy angels. Satan never rules hell. He never will. He never did. Someday he will be cast into hell by a holy, just God. He does not rule. Jesus rules heaven, and as hard as it might be for some of us, Jesus rules hell. In fact, in John chapter 5, it says this, Jesus is the one who will judge you, right? Some of us, we've gone to our family and friends, and we've said this very, these very words to them. You can't judge me. Ever been there? You can't judge me. And I'd say, no, they can't, but Jesus can. Jesus can, and Jesus will. And when you die... There's no opportunity for salvation. It's too late. 
The door slams shut behind you when you die. And here's what will happen if you don't know Jesus. He will sentence you to a punishment in hell that absolutely fits the degree of wickedness that was present in your life. He's going to do this. That means some people will suffer more than others, but all who fail to pass through the narrow door will suffer forever. We need to see it. It's it's there in Scripture. In fact, the Bible says this, that me as a pastor or teachers, we're going to be judged more strictly, right? Right? I I can't avoid this. It's right there in Scripture. I'm going to be judged more strictly and harshly as a preacher. That means I need to stand before Jesus and give an account for my words, including these words today. So here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to sell you some fluffy lie. In fact... I can't even soften the blow. So I'm going to treat us as adults. I want us to make our own decision, but I also want my hands to be clean of your blood. I want you to make the decision fully aware of this. There are consequences for living a life in sin without repentance to Jesus Christ. So it's in our courts to deal with with that. And God sets this before us. So don't take this that I'm talking down to you, that I've got this all figured out, but take it this way. If I could literally, let's say you're running towards a cliff and you don't see the cliff and I am there and I am running after you and I grab your arms or I grab your legs and I wrap my arms around your legs and I just keep telling you, stop Stop, stop as you're dragging me. Picture it this way. People are on a road to an eternity without God. And if we know Jesus, we should be the ones with our arms wrapped around their legs, screaming, begging, pleading, crying, stop. It's hard to talk about how. But Satan has the world, and many people in the church believing that hell does not exist. He does. 60% of people believe there is no hell. Okay? In our world today, 60% would declare there's no hell. And in the church... We're all warped because we think a God of love would never send anyone to hell. However, a God of love also has to be just, right? A parent who loves their kid, you also have to be just. So love and justice, if you want to believe it or not, goes hand in hand. Here's another lie that Satan tells. Lots of good deeds can balance out a few bad deeds. He loves to tell this lie. It's the core of how God grades on a curve. Just ask anyone, right? And here's what they'll say. Well, my good deeds balance out my bad deeds. At least I didn't do what they did. This happens over and over. Just ask anybody and they'll say this. And and the reality is they'll say good people go to heaven, right? So we've had Mormon girls sitting at our table, and we've asked them the question, so what is it that brings you to heaven? And they basically declared, as long as you're good, you'll get there. That's not what the Bible says. It's never declared that being good gets you to heaven, yet it's the most popular, it's the most assumed lie in our culture today. So why did... Jesus turned this notion upside down. Just so you know, Jesus doesn't believe that good people go to heaven. He doesn't. And if you're like most people, you believe once you die, once you die, your soul goes somewhere, right? Most people, some just believe you cease to exist, but majority of people believe your soul goes somewhere. So the logic sort of flows like this. There's a good God 
who lives in a good place reserved for who? Good people. That's the logic. Obviously, the criteria for making it to this place is doing good and being good. Each religion has its own variation of the definition of good, by the way. Generally, men and women must do certain things and not do certain things. And if they do the good things, then they're good people. This even shows up in our church. By the way, we've added some extra rules to the Bible. That's unbiblical and that's wrong. But it's basically this, and the logic behind it's right there. If you do well in school, you grade to the next level, right? You go to your next grade. So the logic is there. If you do well on the job, you receive sometimes promotions. You receive uh, raises. So being rewarded for our human effort is almost expected. Are you with me? That if I do well, I should be rewarded. So it only seems fair that if I do well in this life, I should go to heaven. It only seems fair. What other view could there possibly be? Are you saying bad people go to heaven? That's unthinkable. It's unthinkable. In spite of all The religion's differences, the major religions of this world, they have one common denominator, including ourselves, if we place ourselves into religion. And here's what it is. How you live your life on this side of the grave determines your destination in the afterlife. So, here's what many people say. The experts can't be wrong. And I would like to say... The one true expert disagrees. His name is Jesus. Everyone I've ever met who believes that good people go to heaven have wonderful and amazing things to say about who? Jesus. They have amazing things to say about Jesus. But the truth is this. If you embrace the notion that good people go to heaven, you cannot embrace... Jesus or his teachings, if you're going to be intellectually honest, right? So some people who think, really, they went to college, right? They have a degree. They got this all figured out. They're smart. They'll say this, good people go to heaven. Jesus is a pretty nice man. I like Jesus' teachings. And Jesus taught the very opposite of what most people in the world believe. This just blows my mind. His standards were even higher than the Old Testament laws. He taught even the best of the professional do-gooders, there's a lot of them around, that their best efforts wasn't good enough to enter God's kingdom. He taught this all the time. As well, he claimed this, that God desires to give men and women exactly what they don't deserve, including, get this, bad people, including bad people. This was a major departure from the religious teachings of the day. It was a departure from anything that had ever been taught anywhere in time before. Nobody taught this. The whole idea was so maddening to some people that here's what they did. They murdered Jesus. They murdered him. They crucified him. And in one particular instant, it's very eye-popping. We see what Jesus actually believed when it came to eternity. And Luke re- records this exchange on the cross. So if you have your Bibles, Luke 23. And we're going to see if Jesus really believed, do good people go to heaven? Do good people go to heaven? So Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 41. This is what we read. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, 
Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Verse 40. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Notice this, church. You need to notice this. The second criminal readily admitted that his life was so horrible that he was actually getting what? What he deserved. He readily admitted this. Then he does the unthinkable. He asked Jesus to what? Have mercy on him in spite of his worthless life. He declares to Jesus, have mercy on me. And here's what Jesus said, verse 42. He said this to Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Keep in mind, this man has no positioning of bargaining. He's hanging on a cross, about to die. So there's none of this. Well, Jesus, from now on, ever been here? Please, Lord, help me, help me, help me. Now that you help me from now on, I will do this. So, so this criminal has no bargaining. He can. He's dying on a cross. So he doesn't have this, well, from now on, I'll do this. The opportunity for doing good has come and gone. He's hanging on the cross. He'd come to the end. There's no chance to make up for lost time. None of that mattered, though, to Jesus. Do you notice this? None of it mattered. So Jesus, picture this, he would have been hung on a cross, pushing up on his nail-pierced feet. He breathes a breath, and here's what he says to this criminal. Truly I say to you, this is verse 43, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. Has he done good? No. He's done absolutely no good. In fact, he's on the cross dying justly for what he's done. But Jesus looks at him and says, I have mercy, and today you'll be with me in heaven, in paradise. Do you realize what this means? This is one of the last acts before Jesus dies. He clearly does not believe that good people go to heaven. He's operating off of this premise unknown to anyone else, right? We reward what? Good behavior. Jesus has grace on bad behavior, and get this, even on good behavior. We need to see Jesus and what Jesus believes. Do you, you need to see what this really means. No wonder people refuse to take his teaching seriously. They don't make sense. We can't really understand them. We can't really grasp them. But Jesus promises people precisely what they didn't deserve. And if you're here today and you have salvation, you did not deserve it. But Jesus has poured it out on you. He's given you something you do not deserve. Fourth lie Satan likes people to believe. Only an ignorant bigot thinks Jesus is the only way. Uh, I haven't had ignorance said to me yet. But when I've made this claim, I've had people come up and just tell me, Howie, you are very narrow-minded. This day and age we live in is one of tolerance, where everybody is right, and no one has the right to be wrong. We live in this day and age, right? So I could stand up here and tell you crazy things in our culture, and you would have to be tolerant of it, all right? And if you view Jesus is the only way, you're viewed as closed-minded, 
So when we say this, Jesus is the only way to go to heaven, many people start a little uproar in their hearts and go, absolutely not. You are so closed-minded. You are so intolerant if you do not believe that there are many ways to go to heaven. Now, here's the reality. I'm not saying this. God is saying this. So just before we jump all over the messenger, let's consider this. People who judge God because God said this. So what you're saying is, God, you're not right. And God, you're not fair. But God declares because Jesus is God to be the only way. So you are judging not the messenger, but God. So let's just think about this. Would you be more pleased if God was tolerant of everyone? Let's just take this. Let's carry it, including rapists, pedophiles, pimps who sell off even young children into sex trade. But God's tolerant? Do you think God's tolerant? Well, that's what we're saying. But would you be happy with a God who would go, oh, well, no big deal. Like, let's break this down for what it really is. The idea is completely crazy. It's unjust. Oh, you raped someone? He shouldn't go to prison. In fact, let him roam. Let him just roam around the neighborhood. Do you think we'd say that? Absolutely not. Not everyone in hell, by the way, is a rapist, but everyone there chose sin over God throughout the ages. They love their sin more than they love their Savior. And here's what a loving God does. He protects his children from sin. This is why. This should be what drives us to hate our sin if we know Jesus. God hates sin. So we as his followers hate what? Sin. So when sin is in our own lives and we're disobedient to God, there should be a feeling that wells up inside and it should be one of hatred towards your sin. Are you with me? You need to see this if you know and love Jesus. God wants his children to obey him. And here's the thing. A loving God protects his children by separating them. He chose Israel in the Old Testament, and what did he do? He separated them. In our salvation, he has chosen us, but he has taken us out of, get this, living what? of the world. Live in the world, but not of the world. This is sanctification. God has taken us out of the world to live for him. Okay? Are you following? So we live for his glory and honor. That's why people who don't know Jesus should be saying this all the time about Christians. They're just weird. They should be saying it all the time. They're just different. They live their life. Now, now, when I say different, I'm not meaning the crazy different, right? Right? So where you're running around wearing long dresses, guys are all in... No, that's, we're not talking that. We're just saying we live differently because our values are different from society's values. Now, since God is a God who's just, for those who sin against him and do evil to his children, he will someday pay back. Because he's just. That means just like our society, right? Drunk drivers. What do we do with them? We put them away. Murderers. We put them away. So are we being tolerant of them? No. We're being intolerant and they are getting what? They're just punishment and they're being separated From society. So to call such actions on God's part intolerant is very shameful because tolerance would denote both approval and support of evil. So if God, right, was was in a way, let's say this, if God was intolerant, are you with me? He's going to be 
just. We need to see this. And people all the time, they love tolerance, right? Let's accept all things. The reality is we're hypocrites in even saying that. Let's talk about this. The truth about sincerity. Sincerity can't turn a lie into a truth. Okay? It never can. You cannot make a lie and make it true. In fact, let's say this. If I go to the doctor, uh, when I turned 30, right, April 6th, I was, I was uh, my birthday's the 7th, I was 29, about to turn 30. I went to bed that night, waking up knowing that I'm about to hit a pivotal time in my life, right? Those of you who hit 30, if some of you are remembering way back, right? <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, no, life's over. And then you're like, no, 50, I'd say, oh, now it's 70. Now you're, it keeps getting pushed. But 29, about to turn 30. And I, I remember going to bed that night saying, you know what? I'm going to really make my 30s count. I'm going to love 30. And I woke up the next day, and I couldn't see out of my right eye. <laughs> I was blind out of my right eye. I opened my eyes, and I could not see out of my right eye, and I just went, what just happened? Is this 30? (laughs) And uh, I realized as I got out of bed and walked downstairs, uh, at the time my wife was visiting her parents in Montreal, so guys were not good with pain, right? And I walked downstairs, and all of a sudden light hit my eye, and I was flipping out. Right? Like, God, now's the time you can take me. This is horrible. Whoa, whoa, it's me. And I ran right to the basement. And I stayed in the basement for the next two days. <laughs> Covered the windows, and I was in the basement because any light hurt my eye. I still couldn't see out of my eye. And I was talking to my wife. She said, How you really should go to the hospital. I said, Well, I'm just giving it a day or two to see if it goes away. Uh, finally, day three, I hopped in the, the car and I went to the hospital. And here's what they did. They rushed me right away to see a professional eye doctor. Now, the thing was, this eye doctor was about to go on vacation. <laughs> uh, so he didn't really have too much time to deal with me. So he looked at it. He said, oh, you got pink eye. And I said, I can't see out of my eye. I'm sure if I had pink eye, I could see something. He's like, no, you got pink eye. And here's what he did. He was sincere, but he gave me prescription for what? Pink eye. For the next two weeks, I used prescription for pink eye, and nothing was happening. So I went back to the doctor. They referred me to another eye specialist who looked at it, and right away he said, that's iritis. You need steroid drops. This is serious. And here's the thing. Was I sincere in taking the drops for pink eye? Yes! Three times a day, I did it. I was sincere. But was it making me better? No. Which shows you can be sincere, but you can be wrong. How many of you have sincerely followed wrong directions? Thank you. Right? Before GPS, there was MapQuest. (laughs) And MapQuest would always want to give you directions, and you would go, all right, I got my three pages, I'm reading them. Why have I arrived at the no exit sign? (laughs) I followed them to a T, and I am here by an old abandoned building saying no exit. Was I sincere? Yes, I was sincere. Did any of you just ever do that? Okay. How about an engineering student who builds a bridge and then he says this, well, at least I did my best. <laughs> Are you going to drive over the bridge he built? No. Was he sincere? Yes, I did my best. 100% of the time when we check to see if sincerity can trump a lie, it never can. It never can. So if we sincerely believe a lie, we'll get the fruit of a lie every time. You need to see this. But somehow, 
We bought into the lie in the spiritual realm, and it's sort of like we're in Alice in Wonderland. We want to believe it, but is it real? No. And if you ever watched Alice in Wonderland, you know what I mean. It looks cool. I'd like to walk into a world like that, but it's not real. Here's another lie. When it, or here, here's what we need to see. Satan wants us to believe, believe many lies. But the reality is this. When it comes to worshiping God, are you with me? Truth matters. If I'm worshiping God, I need to know the truth about God. So it does matter. John chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. This is what we read. Jesus is encountering a woman at the well from Samaria. They have a conversation. Jesus has just exposed. You've been married five times. The guy you're currently seeing is number six. And here's what she says. And here's what Jesus says after this conversation. Because once he pinpoints that, that's a little uncomfortable, right? When, when, when we get pinpointed in our life of things we're uncomfortable with. So uh, she says, well, Jesus, uh, the, people in, the people in Jerusalem worship in Jerusalem. We worship on the mountain. Who's right? So she takes it off her sin and goes where? To uh, a rabbit trail. Ever gone on rabbit trails? You, and here's what Jesus says. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And here's what Jesus says, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers, you need to see this, will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in what? Spirit and truth. So, when it comes to worshiping God, truth matters. Jesus, talking to the woman at the well, he basically says, the times here, we worship the Father in spirit and truth. We in churches have reworded the words of Jesus, and we've said this, as long as you worship in spirit, that's good. The reality is you worship in spirit and truth. Just not truth, but in spirit and and truth, because if truth just becomes cold, hard facts, then you are not empowered by the Spirit. So when you're empowered by the Spirit, you worship the truth as well. You need to see this. It's a lie from Satan that sincerity on any old path will do. Let's talk about God's love. God is love, right? Where do we get the idea God is love? I need you to help me. The Bible, that wasn't like a trick question, right? Thank you. Where, where do we get the idea? From Scripture. In fact, we get it from 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. But what we like to do is take the tail end of chapter 4, verse 8. Here's what we read in 1 John. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So here's what we do in our churchy world. We take God as love, we pull it out, and we stick it on a mug, we drink our coffee, our tea, and we go, God is love. God is love. I hear this over and over and over. And is God love? Yes. yes. He's love. It says it right there in the Bible. I can't deny it. So the Bible works this way. God is a God of love. But what's the beginning of wisdom? Fear. We want to understand. What is it? Fear. Fear. God is a God of love, but the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Here's the thing. We can proclaim God's a God of love, but if we fear the Lord, we also look at God from Scripture from the whole view. He's loving, but he's just. Is he wrathful? Oh, it's right there in Scripture. There are things God did, and we, we go, that's not fair. We're telling a holy God who has no sin that he's not fair. Go figure. The creator, the created telling the creator what he should do. That's what we're doing. Proverbs 1 7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and here's the thing fools despise wisdom 
and instruction. The most basic thing that anybody needs to know is this. So if you got absolutely nothing today, get this. Don't mess with God. Don't mess with God. The Bible declares he's holy, he's just. In fact, he can't be in the presence of any sin. He's, it says in scripture that God is a God like a holy fire. He consumes sin. He can't be in the presence of sin. So many of us like to go, well, he's a God of love. He should just love all people. But let's just break this down. Let's say today after church, I'm coming to your house. And I'm taking everything you own from your house. I'm going to do it. Okay? Now, I take it, and then let's say I die, wait, we die, and I stand before God, and I, God goes, you took everything, let's say Wanda, you took everything from Wanda, Howie. And I go, oh well. And God's like, that's okay. That's okay. Wanda's there like, huh? <laughs> what? He took everything I own, and you're just going to say, Wanda, I'm a God of love. Who are we fooling? Like, let's break it down for what it really is. Many like to view God as Mr. Rogers in a cardigan. (laughs) Right? Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. This is why we have problems with these verses. Jesus says this. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And here's what Jesus says. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul, body, in hell. What? Did Jesus just say hell? Yeah. He just said hell. Uh, That doesn't sound like Mr. Rogers. No. That doesn't sound like soft-speaking Jesus. Absolutely not. But he's portrayed in our culture as someone who could care less about what we do. Like hippie loving Jesus. Let's all just have a good time. And when we don't agree with God, guess who's right? It's an easy question. God. Good deeds and God's law. We're going to run through these quickly. Sin kills. It's far worse and more deadly than we assume. Okay? It kills. Uh, in fact, I'll use this illustration. A couple of summers ago, I had Victor Campbell over, and we were running some wire, uh, and I was just doing the gopher roll. Vic knows what he's doing, and I have no clue what I'm doing. He's very gracious in allowing me to even show up. And uh, we we're running some wire to uh, get our garage door to open up. So Vic said, you go up in the attic of the garage. <laughs> And you run the wire. And I went up there, and it was dusty, pink fiber, right? Insulation everywhere. And I was probably up there two minutes, and I started, you're breathing this stuff in? And I'm like, if I'm up here for another three minutes, I'm dead. I'm going to die, right? So I'm trying to do this as fast as I can. I get down. We continue to work. But I'm coughing the whole time. If I was up there for an amount of, of time, right? like a long time, I would not be here today, okay? The good thing is Vic likes me to an extent, and he made sure, what, I I got down. That's good news. And I was thinking about this as I was thinking about sin. Because here's what we do. A little sin is not that bad. And I could be up there going, a little breathing dust in isn't that bad. But keep me up there long enough, and here's what will happen. I will eventually die. I will. So we go, little sin isn't that bad, and here's what we do. We take our little sin, and we compare our little sin with other people's sin, and as soon as we find someone else who has more sin than us, we go, ha, look at me. God, you must be so happy with me. God, I must look so good in your eyes compared to them. This is what we do. We might not stand there and do that, but inside we're celebrating because we found someone who's not doing as well as us. Ever been there? We do this all the time. Uh, We write a test in school. Hey, what's your mark? 
Well, I got 74. I got 76. <laughs> like, whoopee. This is what we do. It's just within us. So we got to see the gospel in light of Jesus. We don't get the holiness of God when we do this and we downplay the seriousness of sin. If we're downplaying sin in our life, we don't get a holy God. So here's what it tells me. You don't understand who God really is. He's holy. He's just. He hates sin. Here's the other thing. Good deeds and religion can't fix it. I've had people, uh, believe it or not, uh, they've missed church for a while. Might be some of you. Uh, and uh, you've seen Pastor Howie at the grocery store. And all of a sudden, you get convicted. And you might start feeling guilty and shameful. And here's what I hear all the time. I'm a pastor, right? It just comes with the job. Oh, Howie, uh, yeah, I've been meaning to get back to church. You know, I haven't been there in a while. But this Sunday, this Sunday, I'm going to be there. And guess what happens? Sunday comes, and guess who's not there? Everybody who told me they're going to be there this Sunday. It sort of comes with... Uh, are you are you following? And yeah, sorry if that was you and you came up to me in the the grocery store. But but here's here's what they're thinking. They're thinking this: I need to get back to church because since I'm not going to church, God's not happy with me. But not only that, they don't even really fear God. They fear actually me. And I go, huh? How he must not be happy with me because? And I'm not even saying to them, hey, you weren't in church. They just instantly run there because in our nature here's what we think being religious can fix it we think this all the time and it doesn't matter how religious i am this is the biggest misunderstanding of anybody it doesn't matter you can go to church for 365 straight sundays but you if your heart is not connected to jesus could be further away from jesus than ever before in your life has nothing to do with being religious. So Jesus preaches a sermon, Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7, right? It's called the most famous sermon ever. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And he preaches this sermon. And here's what Jesus is basically getting at. If he titled this message, it would be this, you're dead. You're toast. That's the title of his message. I think Jesus has a right to have titles like that. And, and here's, here's what he does. He dials in on the Ten Commandments. And if you ask someone, well, what makes you good? They say this, well, I follow the Ten Commandments. So you always ask this question, well, what are the Ten Commandments? Like we even know them. <laughs> like really, like we even know them. All right, we're, you're following the Ten Commandments and you don't even know them. How many can you name? Most people, I'll give them three. All right, you're missing seven. How's that going for you? So you're going to die, and if you're to follow the Ten Commandments, and God says to you, have you followed the Ten Commandments? And you're like, uh, three. <laughs> uh, what about the other seven? I don't. Aren't we silly? Let's, let's be real. <laughs> so Jesus is preaching this, and here's what Jesus says. You heard that it's a sin to commit adultery, but I tell you, even if you have a lustful thought, you've committed adultery. And do you know what people's response there listening to that sermon was? <gasps> They're looking around the room. I had a lustful thought. Did you have a lustful thought? Yeah, me too. Uh-oh, what's going to happen? They're, they're being very religious, and, and Jesus, he's going through all these tough rules, and here's what he basically says. I'm here to fulfill the law. I'm not here to abolish it. I'm here to fill it. Jesus filled the law, by the way, because on the cross, his last words were this, it is finished. So why don't we obey Old Testament law? Because Jesus is the fulfillment, and we obey Jesus. Are you with me? So are you saying I can eat lobster and it's not a sin? Yeah. If you eat lots of it, you're going to suffer from the consequences of eating lots of it. 
And they're stunned. And Jesus says this in verse 20 of Matthew 5. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And do you know what everybody did? (gasps) Oh my goodness. Because they viewed the scribes and Pharisees as the holy people. And they, they, they wanted to be like them. And Jesus says, unless you're better than them, you can't get to heaven. And then he does this, verse 48 of Matthew 5. He says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father's perfect. Let's be real. If you're listening to this sermon, you just went, huh? <laughs> I'm in deep trouble. I need to be perfect just like God. I'm toast. That's the response, right? And that's what Jesus wanted them to see. He wants them to see this. The law, right, is fulfilled in me. It's no longer about obeying rules. It's about having freedom in Jesus. And because I saved you, you live for my glory and my honor. That's what it's about. So let's talk about this because people will go, well, Howie, shouldn't God be fair? And I'd simply say this. God is beyond fairness. He's beyond fairness. The reason good people don't go to heaven is this. There aren't any good people. Are you saying there's nobody good? No. There are only sinners. There are only sinners. There's no good people. And here's the thing. We get so selfish all the time, don't we? And selfishness in our lives, it, it, it takes the love out of our marriages. If we're selfish in marriage, there's no love. It breaks our relationship many times with our children. It fuels ambition to the point of self-destruction. We still haven't found a way to get rid of this task mask, mask, master that's selfishness. It's within us. We're, we're selfish by nature. And no matter how hard we work... Following law, rituals, rules does not promise you a future and a hope. Doesn't. The Bible teaches this. God chose not to give us what we deserve. We call that mercy, right? It also teaches this. He decides uh, to give us exactly what we don't deserve. It's grace. God is not fair. He's even better than fair. So enough of this. Well, that's not fair of God. God's beyond fairness. And by the way, nowhere in Scripture does God declare to be fair. But he declares to be merciful, compassionate, full of grace, full of love. This means this. God went beyond fair, paid for our sins himself, and everyone who gets to heaven gets in the same way. Right? I I can't stand here and say, I'm better than you. I got into heaven this way. No. Whoever gets there gets in the same way. And that's through Jesus Christ. This is what blows my mind. People don't want, people want to believe the good people get to heaven. They say Jesus is good. And Jesus even says, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says this, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says he's the only way. That's narrow-minded. This means everybody's welcome. The Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Eternal life. Good verse. We all should know it if we know Jesus. Believing means placing one's trust in the fact that Jesus is who he said he was. And what he's going to do, it's no longer trusting in what we've done. So we put our works aside because Jesus has done it all. You need to see this. And Jesus basically says this. If there is any other way, right? Then I died needlessly. If there was another way to heaven, Jesus died for no reason. Even in the garden, he prays this. Three times, he he asked God to what? Take it from me. And for three times, God replied basically, no, this is the only way. 
So being sincere, being good, is not enough. It's a lie. Any religious path can't take us there. Only Jesus can. He's the only way. So it's Jesus who says this. Now, he says this, the narrow door, the narrow way, he he declares this, Luke is the narrow door. It's exclusive and it's inclusive. And we'll end on this. Some of you will say, Howie, that's my problem with Christianity. Right there. It's so exclusive and narrow-minded. That's my problem. That's why I don't like it. Friends, we are as narrow as Jesus. So if Jesus says he's the only way, we say he's the only way. If Jesus says he's the narrow door, he's the narrow door. We follow Jesus. We live for Jesus. And before we go and we judge God and we point our fingers, let us look at our own hypocrisy. None of you would die for your enemies. Let's look at our own hypocrisy. Those who have harmed you, those who abused you, abandoned you, betrayed you, maligned you, tonight, would you leave your front door open with the light on and say, come in, come in. Let me serve you. Let me bless you. None of us would do that. But here's what God does. In a world with with its back turned against him, he's opening the door and here's what he's saying. Come, come, let me bless you. Let me serve you. Let me save you. Let me rescue you. Only one person does that. A God of love. Only one person. I would tell you right now, and I'm a pastor, I would not have rapists, murderers in my home saying, bless you, bless you, bless you. Let me die for you. Let's be real. But Jesus has done that. Only one person could do that. So here's the thing. Christianity, it's an exclusive religion. Meaning this, there's no salvation apart from Jesus. He's the only way for salvation. There's no forgiveness of sin apart from Jesus. There is no eternal life apart from Jesus. The path to salvation, the door of salvation. In fact, it's narrow and the journey down the path leads to a narrow door. That's why scripture says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way. And then it says, there are few that find it. Here's what it comes down to. All true Christianity is about is Jesus. So we're not trying to sell you behavior modification. I'm not saying leave here today and do this. Leave here today and do this. Here's what I'm saying. Where are you with Jesus? Run to Jesus. Live your life for the glory of Jesus. Well, what does my life look like? Well, you start to make decisions and choices that honor Jesus. Too many people view this as a rule book. Can I tell you, if you get away from viewing this as a rule book, you will have freedom. I love just to open up this. It's no rule book. It's a challenging book. It, it brings up sin in my life that's ugly. Because I love Jesus, my response should be, I want to deal with sin. Not, oh, here he goes again, bringing it up. Done reading that. No, that's good. That's why he's such a good God. He doesn't leave you where you're at, thank goodness. He he pushes you on. And religions in the world, all of them want to tell you, do better, do good. And we're saying, no, don't do that. Look to Jesus. He's already done the good. 
So we're not telling you do better. There are religions that are only accepting of their own people. But Christianity accepts all nations, all tribes, all colors. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are, right? So no matter your family name, you are welcome with Jesus. True Christianity says stop your working. Who are you fooling? Going to church isn't going to save you. Teenagers, who are you fooling? Just because your mom and dad proclaim Jesus doesn't mean you do. Search your heart, church. There's only one door, one way. That door is narrow. It's very narrow. It's exclusive. But here's the thing. In order to get to heaven, in order to have salvation, you need to pass through the door. You need to. And it's inclusive because it's everyone's welcome. And this door, by the way, is opened by God. How beautiful is our salvation? Let's think about it, church. Did we really deserve Jesus to die on a cross? No. And if you know that, and it hasn't changed your life, and you're saying, my life's about Jesus, who are you fooling? Let's just put it out there. You're believing a lie. Satan's got you right where he wants you. And it's leading you to destruction. Not freedom. Not hope. And not joy. Here's why we tell people they need Jesus. Because doing good will never get you there. Doing good will not escape hell. Only repentance. Embracing what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Only that. And I will preach that until the day I die. And if I don't, may God just shut my mouth and may I never say another thing. Church, lost people need to know there's a Savior who loves them. We're going to pray and take up communion. And if you're here today, it's going to be served. And I just want to challenge us as we sing this closing song today. I want to challenge you with scripture. Uh, If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I would say this. The Bible tells you that today is the day of salvation. This is what Jesus says. Today, don't put it off. And as we sing this song between you and God, I'd simply ask you, talk to God, pray to God, say, God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know I need you. God, I know you sent your only son, Jesus, for me. Repent of your sin. And if you're here today and you know Jesus, repent of taking him for granted. If you declare Jesus and your life isn't bringing glory to Jesus, Be aware of Satan. He's probably got you where he wants you. And today you could break out of the chains he's put you in. And you could find freedom and you can find hope. And we're about to sing why. Because of this fact, Jesus Christ paid it all. I have to do absolutely nothing except rely and trust what Jesus has done. Jesus, you are the amazing Savior. Jesus, you are the great one. And Jesus, only you could take our debt away. And may we all someday stand there with our sins covered by your blood. It's only about you. It's always about you. In your name we pray. Amen.